a few videos ago, we were introduced to this equation that was derived by Einstein, which relates how the geometry of space-time is related to whatever matter and energy is present in our space-time. So using this equation, ideally, if we knew what matter and energy was present in our space-time and how that matter was moving and, and all of that information, then we could say what the geometry is actually going to look like. Unfortunately, uh, this equation is extremely complicated to solve. This GAB, this uh, value here, and this TAB, these are actually tensors. So these ABs talk about which component or which part of the tensor we're looking at. So this is actually 10 independent equations, depending on which parts of these tensors we're looking at. And each of those equations are, are coupled and linked to each other. And each of these equations involve multiple derivatives. So in general, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to solve these equations exactly. So how do we actually use this equation to build reasonable models of, of systems that may be present in our universe. A good place to start would be making some simplifying assumptions to what our space might look like, and then seeing how the geometry of that space kind of looks in those simple cases. So one way that we could start is we could just say, I'm going to assume that I have empty space. Uh, let me get a color there. So empty space. And I'm going to assume that this uh, space is spherically symmetric. Which just means that if I'm standing at the center of this space, then in whatever direction I'm looking, it look, the space looks the same. So if I solve for this, I can solve for this. And I might get, if this is the center of my space, that's that center part that defines what where it's spherically symmetric. My space time, and this is just kind of a rough drawing of what the curvature might look like, my space time will look something like this. So this is just a again a, a very rough graphical uh, picture. You shouldn't take much away from it other than that. So where would we actually see something where there's empty space and it's spherically symmetric. Well, let's say I have a star and this star is gonna be right in here and it has some mass. And let's say that that star is not rotating, it's a sphere. Then outside of this region, outside of this star, this is all going to be empty space. So out here is, is all empty as well. Now, Inside of the star, this solution, the solution that we uh, came up with, is no longer valid. So inside the star itself, the space-time might do something that looks like this. So maybe the space-time will curve in this way inside the star. We would have to actually say what the density of the star is, uh, assuming it's, again, spherically symmetric. We could make assumptions of that. and figure out the geometry inside that star, but right now we're just looking at, we're just focusing on what's outside the star. And the rate that this curvature changes at is going to depend on the mass of the star. So this does a very, this solution does a very good job at describing the space time outside of stars. And one of the interesting things is, uh, this curvature is only dependent on the mass of the star. So if I took that star and I compressed it, so I took the same amount of mass, uh, but just pushed it into a smaller space. So it's the same amount of mass. I've just I've just compressed it a little bit. Then the part that's outside the star is still going to look the same. It doesn't care that the star has been compressed. It just cares with how much mass is inside of this area. And we could keep compressing it, and as we compress it more and more and more, ultimately, we're going to end up with, as you might be able to uh, guess, a black hole. And this solution, 
this solution, which was first derived by a guy named Schwarzschild. I think I spelled that correctly. Uh, this solution describes both outside the outsides of stars. So our solar system is very well described by this geometry. And it also describes outside of a black hole. Which is, a, which is a fairly interesting solution, and we'll talk a lot more about black holes. I'm probably going to do a whole other video series on those. So that's one solution to Einstein's equations. Well, let's, uh, let's have uh, another solution. Let's say instead of saying I have empty space that's spherically symmetric, let's say I have a space that has matter and energy in it, so there is matter and energy, But that matter and energy is uniformly distributed over the entire space. So it's all uniform. At every single point in that space, there's the same amount of matter, and there's no preferred direction that it's traveling in or anything like that. So, so that space might look something, uh, something like this. And this space is filled with, with all this matter and, and radiation and energy. But it's, it's, uh, we've made these assumptions that it's uniform and there's no preferential direction. Now this space could be, uh, could be increasing, it could be expanding, or it could be decreasing. And we can describe that, how that space expands or, or contracts, by the Einstein field equations. And this system, this space-time, is very closely related to what the early universe looks like. So when we talk about the Big Bang, at that very early time uh, in the universe's history, that very shortly after the Big Bang, the matter and energy in the universe was almost evenly distributed over the entire thing, and we can use these equations to describe how the geometry of the universe, the large-scale geometry of the universe, changes based on what kind of matter and energy that is present in the universe. So that's another very interesting solution that has uh, huge applications for, for studying the early universe, and I'll do a number of videos talking about cosmology as well and the Big Bang Theory. We can also uh, start with another set of assumptions. Let's say, again, I have empty space, but I'm going to assume that the space is the geometry of the space is almost flat, but there's just tiny little fluctuations uh, in the space. So tiny fluctuations. So if I have my space, when I, when I do this, if I'm assuming that, so I have a, a three-dimensional space here, then I will get something that is known as gravitational waves. So these are actual waves in space, waves of space-time, that can propagate. And when you do the equations, you'll find that they propagate at the speed of light. And they can affect the matter around them. And this is something that is very different than anything that's, uh, that's in the Newtonian theory of gravity. If I have a bunch of rings, then as that gravitational wave passes, those rings will be distorted in in various directions as the gravitational wave passes. And I'm going to do another video set on specifically about gravitational waves. So these are gravitational waves, which are hopefully going to be observed within the next five to ten years. We have indirect evidence that these things actually exist, but we want a direct detection sometime soon. So we see a number of different ways that we can make simplifying assumptions to these sets of equations to actually study the geometries of spaces that are, that are present in the universe. Now, things get a lot more complicated when we have when we can't use these symmetries. For example, if I have a case where two black holes are colliding or two stars are colliding, then it's no longer going to have these nice symmetries and I'm going to get an effect where 
as this matter curves geometry, then these large heavy objects are going to move in that geometry, which is going to change the distribution of matter and energy and going to change the geometry. And these, these things really, uh, really feed, feed each other. So the, the geometry is going to move the matter and that moved matter is going to change the geometry and it becomes very complicated to solve. So we need to use computer simulations to understand those space times. And we're going to look at uh, a couple cases of that and some of the other current forefronts of, of uh, research in general relativity. Uh, we're going to look at some of those frontiers in the next video.